podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. So welcome back to the next episode. We're up to episode 31, which is interesting. I know we're cracking through these um, of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones and Bob Cook. Okay. So here we go. What we're going to be talking about, because it's coming up to New Year, hopefully we've all enjoyed the festivities. Um, I think it's worth just mentioning, Bob, at this point that these are pre-recorded, so we don't know what's happening in the world as we stand um, because of the new variant and one thing and another, what's what's actually going on. So I just wanted to, to make that note. But hopefully we've had a Christmas of some sort or another and we're in between Christmas and New Year. Yes. We thought we'd do a little bit about maybe New Year's resolutions. Okay, so let's go ahead then. So you can start then if you wish, and then I'll uh, carry on. Yeah, I, I think it's worth mentioning for me, um, I don't really do New Year's resolutions. I've got this thing that if I have a New Year's resolution, I usually break it. So I tend to look more outside the box at maybe rules to live my life as opposed to New Year's resolutions, if that makes sense. Gosh, well, I'd be really interested to hear them. Uh, well, I, I do it probably every every new year on, on my therapy stuff. Um, so there's, there's things around, you know, not taking on other people's problems as my own and not comparing myself to others. And what what's one of the other ones? There's another one that I quite like. Some people like them and some people don't. Um, so it all depends whereabouts you're coming from. Make peace with your past so it doesn't cock up your present is one of the new ones that I had last year. So I'm not sure what your thoughts are. Do you have New Year's resolutions? Well, look, I, I look at more from a clinical base. As you do yeah. most things, Bob. Yeah, I mean... I I can make resolutions, I suspect, but most of them I break or I don't really, I suppose I don't really take it that seriously, really. But with my clients, I used to. It's so, kind of like new beginnings at this time of the year, isn't it? We kind of try to have a bit of a clear out and let go of things of the past and start, start anew for some reason. Yeah, so I tend to, um, clinically, I used to, talk to people about what did they want in terms of let's put it into new res, new year's resolution categories but most important i used to really concentrate i think on how they may stop themselves reaching that goal interesting rather than focusing on the outcome yeah so i i would be far more interested in how you might sabotage yourself reaching those goals so if then one of them was for I can't remember what you said, Jackie, but let's just say one of them is to be kind to yourself. Yeah. For example. Yes. Then I would be concentrating on what the person is doing to stop themselves being kind on themselves. And usually what it is, is a parent narrative they got in their head. Yeah. Which they don't really see as their own. Uh, they, you know, so, but it actually comes from somewhere else. So what I, we track down is, how does a person sabotage themselves? You know, so if they're hard on themselves, which really usually comes from somewhere else anyway, is what can we do so the person changes that process from being hard on themselves so they can actually hear themselves uh, so they can be kind on themselves? And usually it's a parental process that they're getting in touch with. Yeah. Usually. I like that. Yeah. It's usually in transaction analysis terms, it's usually the dynamic between the child ego state and the parent ego state. So if we can identify that process and say, put the parent on a chair or a cushion and put the uh, younger self, which is usually what it's about with the client onto another cushion and to get them to talk to each other, we can find out what the dialogue is, um, which is the center of the drama of how come they aren't kind on themselves. Yeah. 
See, what they really need is permissions from the parent quite often, but what they've had in their history is often uh, things like, oh, you're really stupid, you don't matter, how can you be kind, all sorts of things. So the dialogue between the child and the parents is really important when you're looking at the saboteur uh, process, which stops them being kind on themselves, if we pick that as an example. Yeah. It's funny, I, I've been talking quite a lot with clients, not necessarily about the parent-child internal dialogue, but how the the child ego state or how the child copes with certain things. And, you know, often I'm finding my clients being quite critical of their child as opposed to being compassionate and you know, the adult that they are today being compassionate with the experiences of that earlier child and rather than beating it up, kind of giving it a metaphorical hug, so to speak. Yeah, but see, I don't think it's the adult. I think when you're working as a transactional analyst, the first question you need to ask yourself is what ego state are we addressing? And I think it's the parent ego state and not the adult ego state. So what you need to do, I believe, is get hold of the original parent the toxic message and then the child needs to uh with the help of the therapist in terms of protection take on the toxic parent um to, to give themselves new permissions and new decisions to integrate the adult to be different okay is that clear yes yeah yeah it is i'm i'm just wondering if what happens if the the person's relationship with the actual adult wasn't the best, which a lot of that happens, but if there was some trauma that happened okay. between I don't the think it's the adult. Parent. I don't think it's the adult we're talking about. If we if we think of the adult's ego state, thinking, feeling, behaving as the age you are, and there's no contamination from the parent or the child, then I think don't think we have a problem. I think the problem comes where there's an energetic overload with the parent into the adult ego state or the child delusions or, or, or decisions from the past actually contaminate the adults. So I think what we often need to do when we're working in these areas is, our, is to do what they call in TA decontamination. Yeah. So the adult is clear to make those decisions. And usually the work needs to be with the child ego state to resolve those contaminations because it's usually a double contamination i think from parent to adult and child to adult clear those up and then make a new decision to integrate into the adult yeah because it's very rarely to do with the adult it's very rarely to do with the adult because the adults uh, if you're in the adult ego state you're thinking feeling behaving the age you are so for you to be in another ego state there must be contamination okay yeah so it's dealing with whatever the contamination is for the adult to be clear to make that new change which then will lead on to the not self-sabotaging or what what's blocking them achieving their goals as in the new year's resolutions but i think you need to go the child ego state first to look at what was the sabotage and once you've worked out what the sabotage is with the help of the therapist and the protection they offer to then take it on in dialogue with the parent which is usually where the uh, uh, contamination is and then make a new decision which gets integrated in the adult so in other words the child and the adult made that new decision yeah it usually it ends up with the actually to be truthful it usually ends up with the therapist providing new permissions for the child to actually make a new decision they're adult but they need the permissions from the parent because their original parent usually hasn't given them any permissions at all yeah yeah so when you're talking about putting the child on the cushion and the parent on the cushion it's their yeah. own parent ego state it's not their actual parent that's on the cushion it's the parent ego state it's the parent part of themselves that's having a conversation with their younger self yeah in their head, though, it is the real parent. Yes, yeah. And I think that's, that's for me, where some of the crossover is. If they've 
had an abusive relationship with a parent, that that can be quite difficult. Very, or, very I, difficult. Yeah, yeah. This is where the therapist comes in, in providing protections and new permissions. So yeah. the child can talk to the, the toxic parent, otherwise they'll stay withdrawn. Yeah. So often to know, I think, let's recap, often to make new resolutions, we need to find out what the sabotage mechanism is. Then we need to help the child uh, resolve the sabotage process, which usually is, I think, a dynamic between the child and the parent, and then integrate it in the adult ego state with the help of the therapist. Yeah, and it's that integration that is the, the important part, yeah. Yeah, I don't think this will happen without the protection of the therapist or the new permissions by the therapist. Yeah. So I'm all for resolutions, but I much prefer look at, looking at how the client has sabotaged making new, res, new resolutions in the, in, in the past and working with the sabotages so the new resolutions can actually happen and be maintained. Yeah. Yes, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought. Yeah, because as a therapist, we're always looking for the child's, you know, the sabotage, aren't we? So whatever decisions we're talking about, we just happen to be talking about new beginnings, which is true. But unless we look at the um, uh, the past and the problems in the past, how can we ever get to a new beginning? Yeah. Because the past is always going to drag the person back. So it's the, the resolution is in the past, so the person can have a new beginning. Yeah. Otherwise, it won't work. We can't just say, right, we'll just have a new beginning without looking at what drags them back from the past. So yeah. the work's in the past, even though the decision is a new beginning, in my opinion. Yeah. And I suppose there's, there's, you know, work to be done around the client's awareness around even the decisions that they made early on. Absolutely. I All think the, awareness a lot of the time. So that's, for me, a lot of the work I do for them to realise that uh, the decision was made very early on. You right. know, they might not even have any recollection of that being a decision made. Absolutely. And I think we said in the last podcast... I don't want to get too depressing again, but I oh, feel like no, I, Bob. <laughs> what I might be doing that if you go to the A and E on New Year's Eve or even New Year's Day, you'll find more people being uh, over, you know, dealing with overdoses than any other time of the year. So it's a very poignant yes. sense of time, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. So to ask somebody to make new resolutions when they feel so triggered. Isn't a straightforward process. You see, it is for me and you, and it is for lots of people, but when we're working clinically with clients who are particularly disturbed or trauma-based, New Year can often be a trigger. Yeah. And then once we once uh, the New Year process triggers uh becomes a trigger for the person to regress or go to a disturbed place, then we're into a different ball game. And we have to we have to look at the past. Yeah. In my opinion, for for us to go forward to a new beginning, if you like. Yeah, Be, because once we get to grips with that and yeah. we have an insight into our values and beliefs and those early decisions, that's yeah. where true change and transformation actually takes place. We can look at our environment, our behaviours and all those low level things. And change might occur, but it, uh, in my opinion, it's going to be quite short lived. If we look at that deeper level of our, you know, values, beliefs, our upbringing and all those sorts of things and understand that we made a decision in the first place. So therefore we can make a new decision going right. forward. Yeah. Even if those old decisions were Hobson decisions. In other words, they were Hobson's choice. Yes. It was out of surviving. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Which is one of the things I always say to to my clients it's kind of like asking for you know life advice from a four-year-old yeah and, and it's true I, I, yeah 
I mean, the amount of times I've done New Year, um, you know, therapy or or whatever, uh, and the New Year process is so triggering. Triggering, mm. you know. Say you walk, you know, say, say I go and walk my dog around the park and I meet somebody and I say Happy New Year to them or they'll say Happy New Year to me. That's very different from when I'm working clinically in a therapeutic group and I say Happy New Year. Yeah. Because that can really trigger them into a place which hasn't been happy for them. Yeah. Which again, th this is what piques my my curiosity with a lot of, you know, is the meaning that we all put on certain things is totally unique to all of us. Happy New Year, walking your dog in the park is kind of perceived one way, mm. whereas in a different situation or even the words Happy New Year, the client sees it through their reality in that moment and what's going on for them and it can completely derail them. If they've had a trauma-based history, yeah. which a lot of the clients I've got have had, then, you know, in a therapeutic situation where we're dealing with the trauma, the Happy New Year or Happy Christmas or whichever way you want to look at this can trigger them into quite a traumatic episode. Yeah. So, so that, you know, redecision work isn't just going to happen in one session <laughs> around uh, you. That's, uh, that's a, a long yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. But you may start the work. You yeah. may, in fact, get to a position where someone makes a new decision or a new resolution, which they think they can keep. However, you will, as a therapist, know that you're going to keep revisiting that decision again. Yes. Yeah. In my belief system. Yeah. Because to anchor a new redecision in your adult needs uh, a revisiting of that decision many times. Otherwise, the danger is it becomes an adapted decision. And if, and if the person's making the decision from an adapted place, then it won't last very well. No. It won't last very long at all. Yeah. If they're making the decision to please you, that's a great problem which again kind of i suppose that touches on what we we've talked about in the past about the you know the father christmas syndrome or whatever and if they're trying to say the right thing to to the therapist in, from their adaptive child then yeah it's it's not in a line with what they truly want correct yeah mm. oh it's, it's a bit of a minefield it is because my top resolution uh would be to help people, um, especially clinically, perhaps to be kinder to themselves. However, that whole process isn't going to happen in one therapy session. No. So when you're talking about kindness, are you talking about self-care and prioritising yourself? And loving yourself, yes. Yeah. See, the conversations that I have sometimes, th there's you know the sticking point or probably that internal parent is that that's selfish well i'd rather have the word self-aware well i say it's selfless rather than selfish when we prioritize ourselves in a relationship or in life it can be seen as quite self-indulgent i don't know whether that's the, well, the like way of thinking number one i'd like to change the terminology which i always do and number two if you get the parent on the cushion and start talking to the parent, you'll soon find out it's the parent mm. which is selfish. Yeah, yeah. Now, quite often you might get a parent which says, well, I want the best for my son or the best for my daughter. And then you can encourage them to give them new permissions so they can become more self-aware and perhaps take care of themselves. But yeah. you need to get hold of that parent. Psychologically, I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting. It's it's it is all very deep rooted as well because the decisions that we made, we don't even realize that there was a decision made. No, but you see, if a parent says to the child, "You are stupid," mm -hmm. you are so stupid. You are really, really, really stupid. 
In fact, you're the most stupidest child I can ever think of. What happens eventually is the child changes the changes the you to an I. Yeah. And they then believe I am stupid. Yeah. And then they grow up feeling it is them that has made the decision that they're stupid. Yeah. It's not until you start tracing it back can we get to this traumatic resolution. Yeah. And it, it yeah, it, it's it's very difficult for some people to actually understand that there was a decision to be made. I think that's why I like transactional analysis and everything, going back to the very early days where it's like, I'm okay, you're okay. Do you really think that, Jack? No, I like what that, Jackie, but I just don't want to go back to the first point. Do you really believe that? Do you really think that? Do you think that for most people, uh, when they start reflecting on themselves, they find it hard to believe that a decision was made? Yeah. Well, Patrick, for my sake, because I, I don't think that, but we may think the same thing, so I'll be interested. Perhaps it's the way we're um, thinking about this. Can you say more about that? Because, you see, I think in my, when people reflect, they come to my, my therapy room, they come because they believe there's something usually wrong with them or they believe they're crazy or they believe something is up. And as they start reflecting things, it isn't long before they start realising or even say very quickly that I, I made a decision. Now, I think somewhere in that, they are aware they make decisions. The problem isn't, the problem for me isn't that they aren't aware they make decisions. The problem is whose decision is it? Who makes it? And I think it's often the parent that, you know, pushes that decision down like you are stupid. And then the child makes the decision, I am stupid. That becomes part of their personality. And that's where I think you're correct. They don't then think of it as a decision or choice. They think it as a template. They've always been that way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah always been that way they the, the, the and one of the first steps in psychotherapy i believe is that the therapist needs to help the person um and this is where i think we might be talking about the same thing be aware that what the decisions they take about themselves aren't often or you know usually um themselves it actually comes from somewhere else yeah and they need to separate out and once they start doing that they can get better yeah so perhaps we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it, it it's you know I, the conversations I have are that we're kind of we're all born okay, and then life yeah. happens, and in order to survive, we make certain decisions. You know, if we look at the the injunctions and things like that, you, do you know what I mean? It's yeah. it's about our very survival from a very young place that I need to please others. I need to you know yeah. don't be a child i need to grow up quick all these things but ultimately it was a survival decision that we made i couldn't agree more but perhaps you could just sort of illustrate a little bit more about what you mean by okay so when you said you believe that we're born, all born okay we know for example in the in the catholic religion that and we know actually in many other religions and belief systems, they certainly don't believe that. So could you say a little bit more about what you mean by OK? The, we, we're kind of, well, the way that I look at things, that we're born with a clean slate the moment we enter the world. OK, so it's diametrically opposite Catholicism, which doesn't believe that at all. They believe we're born into original sin. Yes. That's okay, by the way. I was just trying to clarify this for the listeners. Yeah, but again, you know, it, it's which way, which, I don't know which side of the fence you're on. We, we all have a birth story. Do you know what I mean? When we're born, there's kind of a story around our birth, let's say. Or is it our parents' story? Well, yes, but it's kind of projected onto us that we are given it, which is what I mean. The actual baby is born okay until it starts to have things introduced okay. to it or projected. Let's take, let's take away the religious part of this because my daughter, if she was listening to this, would 
course, she says Jesus came along and took the sin of humanity on their shoulders, XXXX. So there are many religious belief systems like, say, Catholicism, we certainly agree with that. I actually follow the same belief systems as yourself. And I know Eric Byrne did. And that's the way that I operate and believe in from a psychotherapy point of view. And unfortunately, for lots of reasons, don't believe that. Yeah. And so I come from the same place as yourself. But I always feel very sad with the, uh, the amount of humanity that doesn't believe that. Yes. Yeah. For lots of reasons, by the way. Religion is a big one. Yes, my my sister, I'm not sure whether she listens to these podcasts and I don't think I'm breaking confidentiality or anything, but my sister went through a phase of being a born again Christian and Yeah, same as Jessica. It, it it was it was very difficult for us as a family because her it, it, it was kind of like a bit of a cult, really. You know, there was an awful lot of fear around it. And I can remember for my dissertation on, you know, at the Manchester Institute, I looked at her and how, what part religion plays in certain things about, really you know, being a father figure and, and all those sort of things. Yeah, really interesting. I found it really interesting, yeah. I like a lot of, you know, uh, you know, it, I, so that's what I meant by just to say a little bit more about what you saw, you you, you see as a, a, okay. And I'm very much in the same ballpark as you. Good. So we agree on something. <laughs> yeah. And that, but and, and I also agree with what you said about the the role of the parental influence. Yes. And it starts from day one. <laughs> Start or even before. Quite possibly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A lot of the latest fetus research about the nine months in the womb and the way that the baby is talked to right before, you know, before birth. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of research on the effects of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For example. And even, I don't know whether this is a bit random and I think we're probably going off topic now, but I think I even read somewhere or heard something about survivors of the Holocaust you know generationally their children you know had issues around food and they were related it back to that you know yeah. whether that's a genetic sequencing thing that takes place it's astounding really yeah very interesting that so how are we getting on with our resolution comment we've covered everything <laughs> So, so yes, do, do you do New Year's resolutions, Bob, to finish up? Is that something that you do every year or, or do you look at how you sabotage things, maybe? Yeah, I, I, I look at how um, I, I always sabotage them and how I usually sabotage them. So I might make one to be kind to myself and I try and keep that. But there's huge narratives inside me from my own history with sabotages that. And I think through my own therapy and things over the years, I maintain that um, resolution longer than I used to. Well done. Yeah. Even when you were saying that, being kind to yourself, there, there was something here for me, which is that parental part of me, I know, that kind of just, I can feel it bracing when I hear people saying things like that. And especially, I think for me personally, um, under stress, stressful situations, I'm more likely go to, to go to a place or could go to a place where I am not kind on myself particularly. What I am happier over the years, by the way, is that I get away quicker from that place than I used to. That's what I found. Mm. Yeah. It's not that I don't get triggered. It's not that I don't go there, but I don't tend to stay there very long. I notice it and then I can step out of it. Yeah. So that's pretty a good resolution. So, you know, when I say card on ourselves, perhaps, you know, there needs to be some sort of loophole in that, or not loophole, but, you know, I don't want to be perfect to actually people or the, to give people the amount of people that could give themselves a hard time for not actually meeting their resolution. Yes. Is, uh, you know, paradoxical in itself yeah. in what we're talking about. Yeah. I think that's why. That, I don't make them. It, it's like dry January. I don't drink. I don't. I don't like drink. I, you know, birthdays, celebrations, the odd one. But if I 
said I was going to do dry January, I know I'd want to drink. Oh, oh. There's a rebellious kid in me that comes out. Mm. So there's a, there's a lot in making resolutions, isn't there, psychologically? Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. So what are we going to do next time, Bob? Because we've got a great big long list. And I'm quite interested in maybe covering the rise of online therapy or how to work with people who have intrusive thoughts. I think those are two really okay. good. So which one would you like to do next? I'll go with whatever you choose. How about looking at the rise in online therapy as we go into the new year and Great. seeing Great. how that works? Because you just touching on that, I know that you you are seeing clients face to face. I'm still not seeing clients face to face in real life. I, mean, it, it, I don't see people clinically anymore, but certainly at the institute where there's 15 or 16 therapists, they all work face to face. Yeah. But I'd love to talk about the art. The, you know the rise of online therapy I have a lot to say about it me too text therapy what's that about don't take me down that line but <laughs> I'm happy to talk about the. Uh, well, yeah, I think we, we that one might be a long episode when we do that one Bob yeah we could perhaps text but I understand what you mean yeah so so until the next time thank you so much and yeah, happy new bye. year uh, good and you see you soon bye bye you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode <laughs>